For Criminal Media's Policy, I'm Tabi Madiba. Joining me today is researcher and analyst Professor Raymond Sadna, here to unpack his column titled The Contribution of the UDF and People's Power to Our Understanding of Freedom, Part 4. Um, you place a lot of weight on the statement of Professor Mahmoud Mandani to the effect that the victory of liberation movements represent the defeat of popular movements. So how can that be in that almost of all these liberation movements were involved in setting popular movements in motion? Well, that is the history that you have uh, popular movements in a number of countries which in the transition from being popular movements to becoming independent, or in our cases, getting rid of apartheid, change their character, and they become movements that stand in for the people. They don't, in the popular power period, the the organizations that made popular power in the UDF, in street committees and so forth, were the communities and the leaders were part of, uh, themselves part of the same structures. During the state of emergency, uh, much of the UDF was crushed in the sense that the leaders were arrested and uh, there was disarray. Uh, In that period, we first had the MDM, Mass Democratic Movement, uh, standing in for the UDF, making very good statements, but they were not connected to structures like street committees, zone committees, things like that. And then very quickly, you had talks, and in talks, uh, negotiations were set in motion, During negotiations, you had, by definition in negotiations, everyone can't be there, but you had people getting involved in very complicated talks and reporting back to the people, as opposed to the people making their own decisions about what they needed in their communities. So what I I see Mamdani as saying is that the process of victory of liberation movements turned them into national democratic states. And instead of popular freedom, you had state freedom, an independent state representing the people of South Africa. So I place a lot of weight on that as leading to the displacing of the popular in South African political history. And you also say that people's power often created community governance that was beneficial to members of these communities. So what is your evidence? Well, in the 1980s, um, a number of bills or legislation was introduced. And after rejecting these, there was a period of what was called ungovernability, where uh, police, Bantu administration officials, all authorities of the apartheid regime were kicked out of many, many townships. And the ANC and the UDF believed that uh, ungovernability couldn't be a permanent state of affairs. You needed to have some form of governance. And they advocated the establishment of elementary organs of people's power. And what they did in a number of townships is that they established street committees and a number of other committees to deal with the problems of those communities. And they purported or claimed or attempted to involve everyone in the community, not just UDF supporters or ANC supporters, but people from all political persuasions. Now, they looked at the problems of the communities. For example, youth had no recreational facilities, so they set up people's parks. They tried to assist with sports activities. But one of the most important things that people's power did in a number of communities 
was to set up organs of popular justice. Now, people make the mistake of thinking that this automatically meant people's courts. Now, people's justice may have meant people's courts in some cases, and in some cases there were abuses, but it didn't have to be courts. The preferred method of dealing with conflicts within the community was to mediate because the people who were involved in a conflict had to live with one another afterwards. Now, in the Western uh, conventional court system of a common law, you have a judge or magistrate sitting up there. He doesn't know the people. He, he or she makes a judgment, afterwards never has to see the people together, uh, people again, and see that the judgment worked. Now, in this system, in contrast, and it bears some similarities to the customary court system where people had to live together afterwards and they had to make some sort of decision that made it possible for them to live together as good neighbors and not have conflict again, not to kick them out of the community or put them in jail. And lastly, Raymond, how do you account for the extensive violence and abuse that beset many people's power experiments? In the second state of emergency that started June the 12th, 1986, they arrested 30,000 more people. And a lot of the people that were arrested were older members of the community, more experienced members of the community. And that meant that the youth were in control and was easier for Tutsi type elements to infiltrate the people's power experiments or so-called people's power experiments. And youth tend to be more impatient, so there was more use of violence. So what we learn from that is not just that there was violence, but you can have a typology, a formula for when people's power worked. It worked when the whole community was involved. And I give the very exemplary example of Port Alfred, where they established what they called a central committee involving women, youth, workers, um, teachers, a whole lot of other sectors of the community. So when a decision was made to have a consumer boycott, or a stay away. They didn't have to enforce it with coercion. People were themselves part of the decision because that so-called central committee came from the whole community. And that was how decisions were made, by consensus, not by force. That was Professor Raymond Sadna speaking to Krima Media's Polity about the contribution of the UDF and people's power to our understanding of freedom at four.